Hello, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. This time we're going to look at the Milky Way's appearance. And the Milky Way is one of the most spectacular sights that you'll ever see in your life. And it's being robbed from us because of the nature of a light pollution across the entire world. Um, but it's a part of our human history. And as such, it's something that you need to go out and see if you can sometime in your lifetime. There are too many lights in cities, there's too many lights in towns for you to see the Milky Way in its grand splendor and glory. But if you go to dark places where light is not present and you can actually experience nighttime as it was meant to be experienced, then you too can, can see the Milky Way as the ancients did and as people up until recently as the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s saw the Milky Way in the sky. But the Milky Way itself is our home galaxy, so let's go see what that is. And this is, of course, a background picture of the Milky Way in the sky. So I was out in Colorado for the recent uh, total solar eclipse in August of 2017. And on a friend's house, I over I looking outside of outside of Boulder, I looked out on the porch and I could see the Milky Way, so I took a picture of it. This is a 60 second exposure of the night sky with a standard DSLR camera looking out into space. And we see this cloudy sort of structure, and that's the Milky Way. It's a diffuse band of light that's in the sky that has dark patches all through it, and those are dust and gas. That, uh, that's dusty lanes inside the Milky Way, but it's, the, but it's that cloudy sort of the appearance that's not smoke from a distant fire. This is in the sky. And so this is a bit of di slightly different ISO on top of it, and you can see that the, the appearance of the Milky Way as a cloudy, bright cloud in the sky punctuated by dark bands. And here's another view uh, from Maine some years about in 2016 by uh, Tony Sharfman with the AAI group. And you can see there's the dusty, there's the glowing band of light in the sky, and that is the Milky Way. Um, and then there's another better view of the center of the Milky Way, as seen uh, by another amateur astronomer. Uh, and here's a view of the Triffid Nebula and the Lagoon Nebula embedded inside the inside near the center of the Milky Way. And here's a view that was taken by Stan Honda of the Milky Way, uh, looking out over over some dark over the horizon with some sky glow from distant, distant, distant cities. But there it is. We can see the dark, the band of light in the sky that never changes from generation to generation for humans. So this is what Galileo saw in 1610. And this is what you'll see if you go out to someplace extraordinarily dark. So the Milky Way is our home galaxy. And this is a Stan Honda image, of course. And our home galaxy is the place where we are. Now, I'm not talking about the clouds on the horizon or the, little, or the platform there. I'm talking about the band of light that looks like a diffuse thing that looks like it has smoke in front of it. That's not smoke. That is dust in the Milky Way itself. And there's another view. This is an astronomy picture of the day taken from Australia of the center of the Milky Way on August 23rd, 2010 at Lockhart Gorge in Victoria, Australia. So go look at that astronomy picture of the day image. But what we see is the galaxy itself uh, a, where we have a dusty band going across that's faint, hidden in the glow and stars are embedded all around it in front and behind it. And there's a brighter area towards what we might call the center of the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is that diffuse band of light that crosses the night sky, and it's been seen for the entire span of all human culture, and only people under the age of 35 today have not seen it. It's amazing. Most people alive today, born within the last 30 years, have not seen it, but every human prior to their birth has. And it's had many names, the Celestial River, the Celestial Road, a path, the backbone of the night. And our words galaxy and Milky Way are derived from Greek and Latin derivations. And Galaxius means the Milky Band, and Lactea is Milky, and Via means road. So Via Lactea is the road of the milk. So a Milky Way or a Milky Band or a Milky Path has been something that's been seen for thousands upon thousands of years and it was part of our upbringing, it's part of our evolution and when you actually go and see it you will be connected to people who were alive thousands of years ago, tens of thousands of years ago who looked up at the sky and made up stories about the nature of that Milky Way. 
So what are galaxies? Galaxies themselves are huge assemblies of stars and gas and dust, and they're all held together by gravity. And the largest have about a trillion, that's a thousand billion galaxies or stars or more. And the smallest are really tiny with only tens of millions of stars. And our, the nearest neighbor to the Milky Way is the Andromeda Galaxy, or Messier Object 31. We both have about, oh, both our galaxies are about 200 billion stars. For about 400 billion stars between the two galaxies that make up the local group. And this is the Pinwheel Galaxy, or M101, and this is an image taken with the uh, Palomar Digital Sky Survey. All right, so let's take some full sky views of the Milky Way to see what the Milky Way looks like in different wavelengths of light. We started off this entire course looking at different wavelengths and noting that light comes in different wavelengths. So this, these are both full sky views. One is a full globe image, so I'm kind of trying to allude to the fact that we're looking at the entire sky in the lower right by comparing the same kind of projection that the sphere of the Earth has to the projection of the entire sky. And what we're looking at in the lower right is a full sky image of the entire Milky Way. And the Milky Way has a series of things that are apparent all throughout it. There's dust clouds, there's glass clouds, there's glowing regions, and this is an all-sky image in optical light. So this was assembled from as a mosaic of hundreds and hundreds of pictures have taken from many observatories all around the world because the Hubble Space Telescope, even though it takes pictures in optical light, its field of view is far too small in order to create this image. So this was created as a result of a massive mosaic of lots of different observatories that were all over the world in order to make this. And if you look closely at this image, you can see that there's some patchy sort of things when there's slightly different resolutions and slightly different uh, color schemes. But in general, what we see is a dusty band of glowing light that goes across the galactic equator. And so we'll call this the galactic equator where we have a coordinate system centered on the center of the Milky Way. There's stars above and below, and there's a dusty material that kind of permeates the center of it, or the galactic equator. Just down a little bit uh, to the right from the center of the galactic equator, we see the large and small Magellanic clouds. And way off to the left, on just below left, is a tiny little band. That's the, that is the Andromeda galaxy over there. And there's pink glows, uh, and those pink glows are star-forming regions, or H2 regions, or regions of the sky where, where stars are forming, and that's hydrogen gas. So this is the view that we see. Yellowish stars towards the center, bluish stars, and pinkish stars, pinkish glows all throughout the edges of the sun. And way over on the right-hand side is kind of a a C-shaped pinkish glow, and that's the Barnard's loop around the Orion Nebula. So if we then look at a specific wavelength of light in visible light, H-alpha, which is uh, 6563 angstroms, or 6563 angstroms, we see the glow that's due to hot stars making the light glow. So H-alpha is a red wavelength of light, and it is the thing that makes that pink glow that we've seen elsewhere, and it is a place where it is due to hot stars, hot O and B type stars that illuminate this gas. And as it illuminates this gas, it heats up, and as it heats up, it emits in characteristic frequencies of H alpha. So these are star forming regions in the sky emitting at a specific wavelength that is due to excited neutral hydrogen atoms. And that is the wavelength is called H alpha. Those, those other dots are point sources. But really, what we're looking at is the bright glows. So where it's brightest is where there's the most H uh, hydrogen gas. And way over on the right hand side, you can see the sea of Barnard's Loop around the Orion Nebula. And off to, away from the galactic plane, notice how the galactic plane is kind of puffy and lumpy with respect to H alpha? There's like bubbles of H alpha. And that's because the gas is being excited by the hot O and B type stars, which excite that gas. All right. So now we shift to much longer wavelengths, and this is a longer wave. This is much longer than the H alpha. It's outside of the optical range. H alpha is still visible light, and you can get that from using filters. But this is an infrared view by, I believe, the Spitzer Space Telescope, and it shows a different view of the sky. We're always going to be doing a galactic equator view. 
But notice that we have this really tight band with some puffy sort of cloudiness around it. But that tight band is much narrower than the light from the stars that we saw in the original optical. And this is because the infrared view is one of warm dust. So this is much longer wavelength of light, so we're looking at cooler processes, and the cool things that we would look at with infrared would be dust. And so dust is composed of carbon uh, atoms, nitrogen, small molecules that bind together to form larger objects, that larger molecular object or dusty objects that are no bigger than cigarette smoke moats. So these tiny, tiny, tiny cigarette most uh, motes might be thousands of atoms in size at the biggest, but what they do is they can absorb and emit infrared light. And as they do, we find that, these, that this dust is confined very tightly to the plane of the Milky Way. And if we look at the infrared camera by the Japanese Space Agency, we still we see another slightly different version of this with a lot of infrared point sources above and below. But our Milky Way is predominated by this dusty band that is glows warmly in the dust. And then at, away from the center, we see it get fluffier. But we can imagine that it's kind of fluffy towards the center, but we just see this large, large thing that might be in the distance. But away from the center of the Milky Way, it becomes fluffier and diffuse as the gas itself becomes more diffuse. All right, another view of the infrared is by the WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, which is a NASA mission. And it's looking at, uh, at dust, and the green and red are due to dust. And the light from stars is, is due to the blue. And the blue-green in the center is due to very, very, very cool stars. And the dusty component is off to the right and left in green. So we see, we see an enormous number of old, cool stars as well as dust and gas. So infrared light is dominated by two components. The first is very, very, very tiny M dwarf type stars or even smaller dwarf stars, the, uh, the, the smallest mass stars. And they are, they're confined to the plane, but you do see some sort of a bulge type thing in the center to elucidate the Milky Way center. But then out away from the center, the, the light is less dominated by that. And away from the center of the Milky Way, we see only the dusty regions of, of, uh, of the green areas. The green area is dominated by dust. So those are the two components that create infrared light. The, the fluffy, cloudy things are clouds of gas and dust. And the blue elucidates the tiny, tiny, tiny starlight. Uh, by infrared emitting stars. Now if we go further and further longer wavelength to 21 centimeter wavelength, which is approximately about 6 inches or 8 inches long wavelength of light, this is due to neutral hydrogen gas that is very, very cold, extraordinarily diffuse, and hardly ever interacts with any, of its, uh, any other hydrogen gas in its, in its surroundings. It also is confined to the plane of the Milky Way, just in the same way that the dusty structure is and, this, and those cool stars are. And so this is a place where there's all, where it's not clumped together, not tightly clumped. So this is hydrogen gas that is extremely diffuse and cold and is due to the electron flipping from one state to another, flipping its, flipping its orientation of its spin from up to down. And that gives off that long wavelength. And this is a radio emission light. And so deep in that radio emission light, we can also look for carbon monoxide, or CO, in microwaves. And microwave frequencies are longer wavelengths of light. And this was seen by the European, this is a map of the carbon monoxide, as, as seen by the European Space Agency's Planck satellite, as it's trying to map the cosmos. And one of its important missions is to map what the heck the, the distribution of, the car, of microwave emission is in, due to the galaxy. So we then see that there's the carbon monoxide is a bright emission towards the center, but it gets very fluffy uh, towards the, uh, it also has these fluffy high cirrus clouds. So the dust component or gas component can be extremely fluffy, like clouds, and they're called interstellar cirrus clouds for that reason. And these are places where the clouds of gas and dust will, uh, 
the, the clouds of gas congregate. But so we think that if we merge the concept of where the carbon monoxide or CO is with the neutral hydrogen, and uh, we, we say that the CO, the carbon monoxide, which is very, very, very low abundance compared to hydrogen, is it's actually clearer to see. Carbon monoxide is much easier to see than neutral hydrogen. However, it's a brighter signal. That's the most important thing. It's a much brighter signal. And carbon monoxide traces the hydrogen. And so where there's carbon monoxide, there's cold uh, hydrogen gas in great abundance as well. And so the all-sky image of Planck spacecraft actually combines multiple bands and frequencies. That's it. That was one of its major goals because it was looking for the cosmic microwave background. So they're trying to take out the effect of the Milky Way. So they looked in numerous uh, wavelength bands in the microwave emission so that they could remove it to see the background emission. And we can see the definite um, cloudy sort of interstellar cirrus structure that is made up of the microwave emission of it. And that comes from very, very cold gas gas that is molecular gas such as carbon monoxide or methane or ammonia or other diatomic molecules such as nitrogen and so forth. Um, and these other things they, they can emit in microwaves and the dusty component can actually be very warm and that also can contribute to microwaves as well. And so the sky as seen by Planck, this is the nine, nine of the, wave, uh, the nine wavelength spans that they view in and you can see the components of the dust and gas as seen by Planck. Now, if we go much, much longer wavelength light, we see what's called synchrotron radiation. So this is at 408 megahertz, and this is an extraordinarily uh, long, long exposure. But this is uh, by the parks, by the Park Observatory, as uh, in, in conjunction with the with an Australian observatory as well. So a couple of radio observatories made this way, made this. Uh, made this map of the synchrotron radiation, which is electrons that are spiraling in the magnetic field of the Milky Way's global magnetic field and traveling at nearly the speed of light. And as it does so, they emit these long, long, long wavelengths of light as they spiral in, in this magnetic field. So the magnetic fields aren't very strong, and the electrons are going extraordinarily fast. So they cover an extraordinary distance as they travel. And we see that there that that the magnetic fields that permeate the galaxy uh, follow the cirrus structure on the on the outer areas, but there's some interesting stuff happening in the center. Now, if we go instead to much shorter wavelengths, and we go to X-rays, which are much shorter wavelengths than we were just looking at, we see the sky dominated by point sources, and those point sources are either black holes or neutron stars or quasars that are that are uh, at great distance. But the point sources that we see in the Milky Way, which is again the band across the center, those are going to be neutron stars and black holes in the cent along the disk of the Milky Way. Above and below are not those types of objects. It could be, but uh, point sources for x-rays are really tough to, to know exactly their distances, but there they are. Many of them would be e extragalactic in nature, but we can see the galaxy's uh, contribution across, across the center. And then if we look at the, Ro the ROSAT survey, we can again see what we saw, saw in the uh, long radio wavelength, which is this kind of strange bubble shape above and below with some very, very bright X-ray sources. X-rays are very hard to focus, so that's why this image is extremely fuzzy. So you can't focus them very easily, so we, we get a very unclear and misty view in, in full sky images of X-rays. But there we see that, that strange cirrus cloud that we saw in the synchrotron of radio light as well. And if we go even shorter wavelengths, the highest energy wavelengths of light, we see gamma rays. And gamma rays are almost completely confined to the, to the Milky Way center, but we see that there's point sources all throughout the sky in the blue area the surrounding. There are some point sources everywhere, but there's some extraordinarily bright gamma ray sources, one from the center of the Milky Way another, and three from pulsars, which are hyperdense neutron stars that are spinning rapidly, and we see the gamma rays being emitted from them, from the crab, which is very close by, and Gaminga pulsar and the Vela pulsar. And these are from very young star, very uh, you, young dead stars, meaning they only recently died within the last thousand or ten thousand years. 
And so they're still able to create gamma rays from the extraordinary magnetic fields that they, uh, that they have as they spin down. But the more interesting thing is that blazar that's there, that thing's millions of light years away. It's, it's hundreds of millions of light years away, yet it's one of the brightest sources in the sky. The Vela pulsar, the Gaminga pulsar, and the Crab pulsar are all in the Milky Way and quite nearby. Uh, nearby meaning, you know, within a few thousand light years or so. But that blazar is brighter than them, and in fact, it's much, much, much further at hundreds of millions, if not billions of light years away. And that means we're looking straight down the barrel of a jet of material of a jet from a supermassive black hole. As, as material falls into that black hole, it gets accelerated to nearly the speed of light and creates gamma rays, and those gamma rays are being directed almost completely towards us. And considering there's hundreds of billions of galaxies in the entire cosmos, and we just see this one in gamma rays, that shows you how rare it is to be looking down the barrel of a jet of material coming out of a, uh, out of a blazar. And we'll be talking about blazars and active galactic nuclei later. All right, and so if we look, this was this image was actually created by a by an amateur astronomer that was looking by an amateur photographer that was looking at the Fermi data that we were looking at before, reduced it away and found that there's these bubbles. So not only do is these bubbles that are surfacing that come up from the radio emission and from the Rosat X-ray emission, but there's these enormous gamma ray emitting bubbles of gas that nobody's really sure exactly what's causing them, but that are seem to be centered on the on the center of the Milky Way. And those gamma ray bubbles are some form of shock induced um, material, where as material hits that, it, it excites the, is, as one atom hits another at nearly the speed of light, that excites the material to emit gamma rays. And maybe even, uh, and then as they emit gamma rays, we see them as bubbles because it's not that there's a gamma ray bubble. It's that there's material that's being shock heated to the point where it does emit gamma rays. So there's some energetic process that's really happening right down there that's due to the center of the Milky Way. All right, so our Milky Way is just one of a sp many spiral galaxies. We see on the upper left the Andromeda galaxy with a galactic bulge. There's a disk and a halo surrounding it. We see M101, the pinwheel, and we see another galaxy, probably NGC 891. And these are the typical types of spiral galaxies, and the Milky Way is one of them. The Andromeda galaxy, M31, is the nearest bright galaxy to us at about 778 parsecs. So if you multiply that by 3, about 2.3 million light years away. So all the light that we see coming from there is about two and, a, two and a quarter million years old. And also remember that the disk of this thing is about 100,000 light years across. So the near edge of the disk, the light is actually younger than the far. So we actually have a time limit, a time machine across the galaxy because the near gal the near side of the galaxy is 100,000 light years closer than the far. So we see the far side of the galaxy further back in the past than we see the near side. That's just wild. But what's neat about the Andromeda galaxy is that it's roughly the same type of stars and gas and dust, similar to the Milky Way from internal studies. And we get the rough view of what, the rough view of what roughly the Milky Way would look like from the outside viewing in. And this is a picture of, uh, this picture is, is drawn from Astronomy Picture of the Day on May 10th of 2009. All right, so another view of the Andromeda galaxy is given to us by the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope, and we see in 24 microns, which is long wavelength infrared, that it kind of has this hot, dusty structure. There's a visible wavelength view that we see to the lower left, but if we compare it to the hot, dusty view, we see that that's predominated by dust and gas, by mostly warm dust, and that's the that's the basic view of the of of Spitzer is to be a dust viewing object, and also some point sources which would be bright infrared stars. But notice that it's a ring of dusty material that emits in this thing. So it's, it doesn't have a spiral structure so much as a ring structure, which is an interesting way of thinking. But we still think of M31 as a spiral galaxy, even though it's more ring-like in this appearance. 
In in ultraviolet light, the Andromeda galaxy also belies that ring-like structure, and ultraviolet light, such as we see here, the blue light is due to hot O and B type stars, and the longer wavelength uh, ultraviolet light is given in yellow. So the hottest areas are given in blue, and we see that the dusty areas that were given before, that's the place where star formation occurs, and the blue is also ultraviolet, which, is, which also traces star formation as well. And the Swift Space Telescope in September 2009 released this incredible study of the Andromeda Galaxy, which is an extraordinary high resolution if you go take a look at it, that shows the, uh, the hottest stars in all of the Andromeda Galaxy and where they're forming so we can see the most active sites of star formation in the Andromeda Galaxy is in, in, in ultraviolet. And notice we didn't have an ultraviolet all-sky survey. That's because ultraviolet light is very difficult to focus and so it, it's much more difficult to create a smaller, a small telescope that can be put up into orbit for this. And the Galax probe was the closest one, and we saw that. But Galax didn't do a full sky survey. It did many, many patches, but nobody's put it together as a full sky yet for it, whatever they've done. And so if we don't go outside the Milky Way, let's say we got a spaceship and go millions of light years away and look back at the Milky Way, and we look at NGC 891, this is what the Milky Way may look like from a great, 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 great distance. It has a galactic bulge in the center. There's a dusty disk that is very, very tightly confined. And then there's a starry disk that is a little bit broader to that. So the stars are not so tightly confined to the disk, but the dust and all of the star forming regions, which are those pink clouds that are embedded in it, are. And the galactic halo, which is in the set with the galactic, uh, the galactic bulge, has a lot of older stars. Which would be in fact, which would be tiny, tiny stars, but there are but there's so many of them there that they resolve into a cloud of yellow. So the galactic center would be where ancient stars would be, and the Earth from the from this Milky Way analog. This is what the Milky Way kind of would look like. So we're using it as an example. The Earth would be about 8,000 parsecs from the center. The galactic bulge is where a where is what we call the central area, and it's mostly red and older stars. And the disk is composed of dust and gas, and we see the pink glow of hydrogen, as well as the dusty, dusty material that blocks the light that looks like dark areas, as well as some bright blue spots where young stars are forming. So we can look at another Milky Way analog, which is NGC 7331, which is about 50 million light years away in the constellation Pegasus. And it's about, it's about, it's just, it's, it is a very, very, very distant galaxy. And the little galaxies behind it are even further, about 10 times farther away than this. So we see all these little spiral nebulae around. And if we zoom in and take a very close look at this galaxy, what we see is, ignore the three little galaxies above it. Those are much more distant objects. And all the stars that you see in this image, the points and circles, those are all part of the Milky Way. So it's this spiral nebula that we were talking about in previous lectures, this spirally sort of thing. That is what we're talking about, and that's what the Milky Way would look like from a distance. And this object is, uh, is 50 million light years away. And as such, it means its diameter is approximately 100,000 light years across, and it would be composed of hundreds of billions of stars all by itself. And so this is a nebula, not of gas, but of gas and stars and dust. And it's the reason it looks nebulous and cloudy to us is because of its extraordinary distance. But it is composed of individual point sources of stars, hundreds of billions of them. And the gas clouds are emitting light in microwaves and in infrared. And it would be, and the hot blue areas would be emitting ultraviolet light. And the pink areas would be places where star formation is occurring and is emitting that pink glow of hydrogen alpha that we've seen in the past. And so Star forming appears to be happening in these spiral arms, and in the center is where yellow, older, and dead stars are, where there don't doesn't appear to be much gas and dust. So this is one of our this is our possible view of the Milky Way if we turned around and went to that galaxy 50 million light years away and turned around and looked back at our Milky Way, we would see something pretty similar to this in the sky. So that's our view of the Milky Way, and I'm giving you these kind of questions to go take a look at what this stuff is and our general view of the Milky Way as an all-sky view. And we'll see you next time.